Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Green. I am the Art Ambassador for the Arts. And because of COVID-19, I have decided it would be fun to read several of my children's book that I illustrated. I would like to read for you today, The Freedom Ship of Robert Smalls, written by Louise Merriweather and illustrated by Jonathan Green. This book has been dedicated to the Jenkins clan of South Carolina because Mrs. Merriweather is from South Carolina. Here we go. Robert Smalls sat on the high seat of the carriage next to the black coachman. He was 12 years old and determined not to cry. He had promised mama. From inside the coach, the slave master, Mr. McKee, gave the signal to start. The carriage rolled forward. Robert was on his way. In the spring 1851, and Robert was leaving Beaufort, South Carolina, where he had been born a slave, he was going to work in Charleston to make money for his master. Mama stood in the dirt road waving goodbye. Be sassy with your work, but not with your tongue, she called out to him. Yes, Mama, he replied. Robert knew what Mama meant. Be good, work hard, and make a lot of money so Mr. McKee would not sell him. The carriage rattled past Mr. McKee's cotton fields. Some of the slaves straightened up and waved slowly. Robert waved back, then turned around for the last look at Mama. She was little more than a lonely peck now, standing in the middle of the road. Robert closed his eyes. It was not for Mama that he was going away to make money. It was for Mr. McKee. No, he would not cry. But why? Why had he been born a slave? In Charleston, Mr. McKee found a job for Robert at $4 a week. Robert cleaned the street corner lamps in the mornings and lit them with a long taper at dusk. He lived with other slaves in a shanty behind a big house. Mr. McKee, seeing Robert settled, returned to Beaufort. Life in Charleston was interesting for Robert. He had never before been in a big city and he liked to mingle with the noisy crowds. But the part he liked best was talking to black men who had been able to buy their freedom. Moses the carpenter was not free, but he could read. He thrilled Robert with tales of Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, and others who had rebelled against slavery. He read to Robert from a newspaper written by Frederick Douglass, a former slave. Frederick Douglass had escaped to the North and was now fighting for freedom of all slaves. Often Robert sat by the seawall in Charleston and thought about Frederick Douglass and other freed black men. They could learn to read and write. They could keep the money they earned. They could live where they wanted to. No one was their master. One day Robert promised himself he too would be free. Three years passed. Robert worked on many jobs for Mr. McKee. He unloaded ships at the dock. He learned to make sails and attach them to the mast. When he was 17, he met a lovely young slave girl, Hannah Jones, in church. Hannah worked as a maid in the hotel. She paid her wages to her master as Robert did. Robert and Hannah soon fell in love and with the permission of their owners were married on December 24, 1856. A year later, their daughter Elizabeth was born. 
Robert held the baby in his arms, marveling at how tiny and fragile she was. But his wife and child were owned by a white man, Samuel Kingman. He could sell them away from Robert at any time. This thought kept nagging Robert. It would not let him rest. Finally, he went to see Mr. Kingman. Sell me my wife and child, he pleaded. Let me buy their freedom. Mr. Kingman agreed for a price of $800. Robert was staggered by the amount, but he and Hannah accepted the challenge. They took on even more work. Sometimes they worked so hard they were too weary to sleep, but they saved penny by penny, year after year. Then, in 1861, the Civil War began. Robert was secretly on the side of the North because in the North, black people were free. However, he was made to work for the Confederate Navy as a wheelman on a gunboat called the Planter. The captain of the Planter and his towmates were white. The rest of the crew were slaves. Robert grew impatient. He and Hannah had saved $700, yet there was no freedom in sight. His family had grown to include a son, Robert Jr., whom he would have to buy. The price of freedom had gone up. He had to think of another way. Charleston was too well guarded for him to escape by land. But what about by sea? Three forts had their guns trained on the harbor. Why couldn't he capture the planter and sailed her right past those guns? The northern fleet was anchored seven miles outside of the harbor. Freedom was only seven miles away. Robert discussed his plans with the slave crew of the planter, and each man was eager to join him. They decided to take their wives and children with them. If anything went wrong, they would blow up the ship and die rather than to be captured. On May 13, 1862, Robert Smalls made his move. He sneaked the women and children into a second ship anchored on the Cooper River. The ship's steward, a fellow slave, had agreed to hide them. They would be taken about the planter after Robert took command. That night, Captain Raleigh and his two mates went ashore and Robert Smalls took over. He readied the ship for action. Jackson, Alston, and Turno, the firemen, shoveled fuel into the furnaces. John, the engineer, checked the instruments. Jabel raised the Confederate flag while Alfred cast off the ship's lines. Robert at the wheel, wearing the captain's hat, steered the planter away from the dock. The desperate trip had begun. When he neared the second ship anchored in the Cooper River, Robert sent a rowboat for the five women and three children. The steward also came aboard, making a total of 16 slaves. Robert headed the ship upstream. He did everything he had seen Captain Relia do. The planter approached Fort Johnson. Robert pulled the cord on the steam whistle and gave the proper signal. The planter often steamed upriver before dawn. There was no reason for the sentry on shore to think this time was any different. The sentry yelled, pass the planter. Fort Moutry came next. Robert gave the whistle salute and again they were passed safely. But the most dangerous part yet to come Fort Sumter was the biggest fort. It was almost dawn, and Robert could see the fort's menacing cannon. 
Would the sentry be able to see that it was not Captain Relia beneath that hat, but a slave? Robert leaned on the windowsill of the pilot house. He folded his arms across his chest as he had seen the captain do. Jebel pulled the signal cord. Robert waved to the sentry on shore. The sentry did not answer. Robert at the wheel, wearing the captain's hat, steered the planter away from the dock. The desperate trip had begun. Robert prayed silently, let us sail through safely. Finally, he heard the sentry yell, pass the planter. They were not going to be blown out of the water. They were saved. Robert piloted the ship past the fort's huge guns and out to the open sea. By the time the sentry realized something was wrong and fired guns, the planter was out of range. The crew and their families crowded to the rail. They had gambled with death and won. Robert and Hannah looked at each other and at their children. They were free. No longer would they have to call any man master. They were free at last. Jebel pulled down the Confederate flag and raised the white flag of truce. When they reached the ships of the Northern Fleet, Robert turned the planter over to the fleet captain. The planter was of great use to the North, valued at more than $60,000. The ship became part of the North's Navy's Robert Smalls became her captain. After the North won the war, Captain Smalls, as he was now called, returned to Beaufort with his family. There he was elected to the United States Congress and served for five terms, fighting always for equal rights for his people. Captain Robert Smalls remained a hero for the rest of his life. As a boy, he dreamed of freedom. As a man, he took it. <laughs>